let's dedicate this talk to our children. Today, I want us to think about climate change, its impacts, and more importantly, our legacy. But first, I want you to suspend this belief just for a few moments and come with me on a flight of fancy. I want you to imagine that you and your cat have built this most magnificent time machine right there on your kitchen counter. I'm sure you understand the concept. You can travel anytime, anywhere. If you're anything like me, you probably have spent hours thinking about this. You've twinkered with it, it's kind of ready. You've actually done a few tests. You've sent your cat on a couple of trips, and he's come back <laughs> mostly OK. Right. So where would you go? Maybe you could see a concert by Mozart. Maybe you'd go and see the pyramids being built. But imagine being there when the Eiffel Tower was finished and joining in on the celebrations. Wouldn't that be great? Unfortunately, your cat, as they tend to do, stepped on the keyboard on your way back, and you ended up on the deck of the Titanic on her fateful maiden voyage. Now, your cat looked what happened, turned around, did a U-boat, closed the door behind you, you can't get in, you're stuck. The first question for you is, what would you do? Now, let me just explain that there's a lot of people that have made the connection or the link between the Titanic and how we address climate change. In these scenarios, usually the Titanic is the planet, the captain is society or our leadership, and the iceberg, of course, is climate change. And the analogy is that unless we act promptly, it'll be too late for us to avoid the catastrophe. But today, I want us to think about something else. I want you to think about the passengers, that is, you and I. So you're back on the deck. You're confronted with the situation. For the sake of the argument, please follow me. I think that people would react in one of three ways. One. They would, some people would actually be so scared they'd be paralyzed. They would be swept away by the situation. Another group of people, and I think the vast majority, would actually think it's somebody else's problem to fix. They would hide. They'd go back into their cabins. And then there's a third group of people, those that wouldn't let their destiny be shaped by others. They get angry. They agitate. They act. They see what needs to be done, and they put to others before themselves many of the times. If you were in that situation, what would you do? I would like to think that we would all act. Now, why am I saying this? It's because we have plenty of evidence that when we see someone in distress, we will do what is necessary to help. We see it every day. For example, when there's a bushfire, people volunteer. As the drought grips the heart of our nation, people are helping when the, the world itself held its breath, when the Thai soccer team was being rescued. So it's something within us. Unfortunately, sometimes when we see distress and it's too far removed from our daily existence, we've learned to ignore it. We've learned to ignore the angst that comes from here of trying to help. We feel powerless. Unfortunately, with climate change, I have to tell you, that there's no volunteer group that's going to help us. We have to help ourselves. Now, I've painted the circumstance where, you know, you would think about being a hero and helping people in the Titanic. You would face possibly skepticism. You would face criticism that you are an alarmist, that you are just basically agitating. But I think that still, even with all of that in front of us, we would help. This is our Titanic moment. We have to help. And we have to help more than anybody else, those that are least capable of helping themselves. That is, the very old, the infirm, the very young, and those who can't afford to escape into their cabins, or, or as I'd like to say, escape into their air-conditioned cars or shopping centers. So, some people might say that there's not enough evidence. We've heard this argument many a times. This diagram just shows some of the lines of evidence where scientists are collecting, not just projecting, but collecting information and hard data that correspond with the projections as what would, would happen with climate change. It's everywhere. 
It's not just something that it's going to happen in the future or that it's only going to be the polar bears that are going to have it tough. We are actually living climate change here and now. We're starting to see it in our natural systems. Here in Canberra, instead of actually putting you know, the idea that climate change is happening somewhere else, we've decided to bring it to us, to personalize it. Because we believe that once you make it something that you understand is affecting you and your daily lives, that you will act. The story that we have for our city is not dissimilar to what we see happening in other places. We're going to get more intense bushfires, more intense heat waves. By 2030, we will have double the number of days over 35 degrees. So if you thought your summer was hot, it's only going to get worse. We're going to have more intense storms. So overall, it might be that the rainfall is reduced slightly, but when it falls, it's going to fall even harder. And so we're going to have floods. So we have to face these things. This chart, I'm sure that you find it hard to see, but if you focus on the bottom line, this chart's about our emissions, our emissions of greenhouse gases. That means every time we burn fossil fuels, we're emitting these greenhouse gases, and they're responsible for global warming and, in turn, for climate change. The bottom line is, the only one, is one of the ones that I want you to focus on, is corresponding to what we've all agreed to under the Paris Agreement. That is, that we will reduce emissions quickly, enough so that the global warming won't go up above 1.5 to 2 degrees by the end of the century. The top line, unfortunately, is where we're heading. You can see those black dots. Those are recorded emissions of greenhouse gases. And as you can see, we're well and truly on track to go to the top, which is an increase in temperature of anywhere from 4 to 7 degrees by the end of the century. Now, you might think that that's not a big deal, 7 degrees, but again, this is the average. As you understand, the average masks the extremes. And if we have an extreme at the top, that means that we won't be able to cater for that. We will not be able or will be challenged to deliver essential services. And again, reminding you of those that are least capable of helping themselves, they will be the ones that bear the brunt. So we have the evidence. And what are we doing about it? Well, as my talk started, welcome to Canberra. Before I launch into telling you all the wonderful things that we're doing here, I'd like to just let you know of my particular experience coming into Australia. I arrived about 30 years ago, and I went down to Melbourne, and I found a city that's full of culture, wonderful people, very welcoming, but they all had something against Sydney. And then I went to Sydney. Wonderful place, beautiful harbour, lots of fun, welcoming people, but they really didn't like Melbourne that much. I couldn't understand it. And then I found out that they, they both had it in for Canberra. <laughs> I came to Canberra, and it was a fantastic, it's a fantastic city. It's designed, it has a beautiful setting of mountains, it's got a magnificent urban forest that we should be very proud and happy about. We have all the cultural institutions here. You know, there's all the embassies, so there's culture, there's always something to do. So I didn't understand it. But then people from Canberra started to complain about Queanbeyan. That's when I understood it's the national pastime. <laughs> but the reason I mentioned this putting down of every city, but in particular Canberra, is because a lot of people tend to dismiss what we're doing here. They say, oh, Canberra is not like the rest of the cities. Well, the reality is that, yes, we're not Tokyo, we're not London, we don't have heavy industry, but into the future, a very large proportion of the population of the world will be living in cities similar to Canberra. We have a knowledge economy here. We're nimble, we're innovative. So the things that we do here to address climate change are probably going to be useful somewhere else. So I think that we need to continue to work. When Canberra heard or listened to the advice from scientists that we needed to reduce our emissions by 40% from 1990 levels, Canberra responded. It immediately started to think, how can we achieve that reduction? Nobody else was doing it. We have the most ambitious targets in, in Australia. And in fact, did you know that Canberra is recognised globally for its ambition in climate change? Regularly, we are on the top five, top three, top ten 
of not only cities, but countries that are trying to work on climate change. So we're up there and we're being recognized. So how are we going to resolve this problem? Well, I have the good fortune of working with some very clever people, some of them amongst you here today. And with the community advice, we decided that the best way to do it was to reduce emissions from the electricity sector. We set the target of going to 100% renewable electricity by 2020. That is, moving away from coal-fired electricity to solar and to wind. I'm very proud to say that we're on track to achieve that. And even Parliament House will be powered by renewable electricity by 2020. Now, that in itself motivates me. But what else? Well, these clever people I work with not only manage to secure the lowest prices for renewable electricity in, Cam in, sorry, in Australia at that time, they also devised a process by which companies that were bidding for, to deliver that service competed against each other and they sweetened the deal. Number one was that all of these projects, either wind or solar, had to be supported by their local community. Very important. We did not want to create or participate in projects where the community was not brought along. And that has helped us a lot. It has set a standard for the way that these companies approach communities around Australia, and indeed other countries are looking at what we're doing. But in addition to that, these companies committed to invest here in our city. Half a billion dollars of benefits are coming in, in the sense of national companies or global companies establishing here, investment in research, development, education. We're actually investing in our knowledge economy and preparing ourselves for the jobs of the future in the low carbon society. So I reckon we're doing pretty good. In addition to that, because, yes, renewable electricity is slightly more expensive, we have a very ambitious energy efficiency program by which this advice is free, available to everybody. We find ways of actually reducing the consumption of electricity through more efficient you know, uh, white goods or by making your house more efficient in the way that it uses energy and heating and cooling. So as we increase the price, and again, Canberra still has some of the lowest prices in Australia for electricity, in spite of having renewable tar you know, targets, the cost or the consumption of electricity is going down. So they kind of tend to balance each other out. We're also investing in renewable transport. By 2020, once we've done electricity, we have to look at transport, and most of it is, or the emissions, comes from cars that you and I drive. So we're investing in light rail, which will be powered by renewable electricity. We're investing in trials, in electric buses, and we have the most generous incentives for the purchase of electric vehicles. They're the most generous in all of the nation. So, I'm going to leave you with a couple of things. I'm not talking about changing your life upside down to get rid of emissions. I'm asking you to think about what small things we can do together that will lead on to greater things and greater steps. You can already look at better insulation in your house. You can think about planting that deciduous tree that will shade you in summer and allow sunlight in winter. You can think about solar panels or solar gas, uh, sorry, solar water heating. All of this is supported by this fantastic looking group of people that I have the pleasure of working with. They have free advice, they're knowledgeable, and they're passionate about their work. So my challenge to you is to make a plan. The first step is come and talk to us and be that hero. Be a hero to your kids. <laughs>